Hello everyone and welcome to another live stream where we're going to be working on revision for your Unit 1 WJC AS assessment which is tomorrow afternoon. Well I hope it's tomorrow anyway but we are going to do a lot tonight because there's a lot to get through. You know from revising this that the AS exam is packed with content. There are 17 topics but having said that there are two topics that you don't need to worry about for tomorrow at least. So this is the circular that came around earlier in the year. These are the two topics that you don't have to worry about in the assessment tomorrow. So topic 11, systems analysis, and topic 17, the economic, moral, legal, ethical, and cultural issues are not in your exam tomorrow at all. Thank you very much, WJC, for reducing 17 topics to 15. I'm sure there's something nicer that could have been done, but that is a positive as far as I'm concerned. Now, of course, your teachers, I certainly have taught all these topics to you, I would imagine. But it's important to remember you're not going to waste your time tonight or tomorrow going over these topics again and again, because they're not going to be in tomorrow's assessment. This is guidance from the WJC. So we don't have to worry about those for tomorrow. That Once again, we don't do topic 11. And we don't have to worry about ethics and morals. And yeah, I'm just going to pop this one up. Uh, just in the real world, we do. Just remember that. <laughs> right, let's get started because I've got a lot to do and I've got 55 minutes to do it in. So here's the list of topics. I've blanked out the ones we don't need to worry about today. I'm going to go through them as quick as I can and try and get it done in that time. I've got about three minutes per topic to get through it in the right amount of time. So it's not going to do justice to it but it is going to give you a quick summary so you know what we're talking about. And we'll start with number one, hardware and communications. So this diagram might be familiar to you. This is the diagram of a CPU. Please note that on the CPU, we've got three main parts. We've got the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit. That's the part that does the maths and the logical calculations, things that come out true or false. Is this the same as that sort of questions? We've got the registers, which are discrete units of memory. That's the fastest memory. That's directly on the CPU. Every instruction that the computer needs to work through needs to go into there. There are some specific special CPUs as well. You need to, sorry, specific registers that you need to know as well, which is worth going and have a look at. And then you've got the control unit. And the control unit is like the clock of a computer. It's where the instruction comes from to do the next instruction. So the control unit is telling the rest of the processor, next, next, next. When you overclock a processor, you speed up that control unit. Now, connected to all that as well as a bunch of essentially very, very small wires, but they're called buses. They allow the transmission of certain signals around the computer. We've got our data bus and address bus, which send the data and the addresses of the instructions. Yes, this is almost a sarcastic US7 answer there. And the control bus sends the control signals, those next, next, next. They're being piped around the CPU via these cables. And these are microscopic. They're probably just traces on the CPU, to be honest. But imagine them as cables for the meantime. Please note that symbol for the ALU. We have seen questions pop up in the past, which have shown that diagram unlabeled and asked you to label it. These symbols, I'm not entirely sure where they've got that symbol for ALU. It doesn't seem to be a real symbol that matters anywhere else, but the WJC have christened that one as the ALU. They've named it that way. So remember, the upside down trousers is the arithmetic logic. As we come away from that, then the CPU is plugged directly into RAM and a hard drive. Now, the point of that is that not all the instructions that the computer needs is going to be stored on that register stack. So the RAM is where all currently um, currently stored or currently working instructions need to be on the computer. The RAM, you remember, is volatile memory. So when the power goes off, this loses data, which is why we need a backing store, a secondary storage device, which is non-volatile. In this case, it's a hard drive. Everything we store on the computer is on there. And we copy it to the RAM on the boot. And whenever we load it, and parts of those instructions are copied to the CPU. But there's more than that because a CPU also has a cache, different levels of fast storage very close to it because the time it takes to copy instructions from the RAM to the CPU does slow it down. 
So what we try and do is we try and keep a copy of the most commonly used instructions a bit closer to the CPU itself. And as a result of that, our cache can store commonly used instructions close. And when we need our next instruction, we go to the cache first. If we can't find it in the cache, that's called a cache miss. And we have to go out to the RAM to get it. And that takes a little bit longer. On top of that, we've got our inputs and output devices. So we've got our storage over on the, on the right there and our inputs and output devices. They are used to put signals into and out of the computer. In this case, we've got a mouse for input and a screen for output, but there's a bunch of devices you need to know about that. And we do need to know about the different kinds of memory because this diagram shows you the difference in the types of memory that we get in a computer system. Primary memory being on the left, uh, secondary memory being on the right in this case in a hard drive. Now, the closer to the registers we get, the faster the memory is, but it gets smaller and smaller in capacity because it becomes more and more expensive. And that memory is also really, really volatile. The closer to the right we get, the slower the memory access is, but the larger in capacity because it is much, much cheaper. It's also non-volatile, or at least the hard drive on SSD is, which means when the power goes off, we get to store that data. All of computers are built around a thing called von Neumann architecture, which essentially is where we store the instructions, the data in the same format, like we get here. And then von Neumann architecture, architecture follows the fetch, decode, and execute cycle, where we fetch an instruction, decode it or work out what it means, and then execute it. We actually do it. And that's what a computer is at its very lowest level, repeating those steps over and over and over again. The last thing is communications, and there's a few bits and pieces you need to know here. The first thing is that a handshake is when we agree which protocols to use. The protocols you need to know for this exam, HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, it is sending web pages. HTTPS as well, which is the secure version of that. FTP, File Transfer Protocol, sending files. SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, sending email. TCP IP, the Transmission Control Protocol slash the Internet Protocol. And that's, uh, that's a protocol which is um, all about computers on the network getting their IP addresses and are sending data to them. So it's the backbone of the networks, really. IMAP, uh, <laughs> internet mail or internet media or something like that, access protocol. But IMAP is the one that stores email on the server for us to access. DHCP, dynamic host control protocol, is the protocol that allows us to give an IP address dynamically to a node on the network. This is a network diagram. These circles are nodes, they're the computers. Uh, the lines are called vertices, they're the connections. Uh, and UDP, uh, Uniform Datagram Protocol, that is how we identify computers in the network in a different way. There's two ways of data going around the network, packet switching, where the uh, packets find their own way to the destination and find the quickest way, or circuit switching, where we reserve a path and send everything down there. They have benefits and drawbacks. Go back and have a look at all those things. How are we doing? Oh, running slow. Let's get on to logical operations. A quick reminder, your NOT gate inverts the input. So if a one goes in, we get a zero on the other side. That's identified by the little line above the letter. An AND gate, both the inputs must be on or one for us to get a one out the other side. An OR gate, I know a number of you are annoyed by an OR gate because an OR gate, any one of A and B need to be on to get a one out the other side. And that includes both of them. If both A and B are on, we'll get a one at the other side. An XOR gate, remember it's, it's exclusive, meaning that only one of the A or B inputs need to be on. That means if they're both the same, we get a zero output. As worth remembering, the tricky bit in all of this is that annoyingly, an AND is a dot and an OR is a plus. You will have to fight against the natural programming from doing years and years of mathematics to say plus as OR. Do it and make sure you follow it in your head. The classic example of a truth table is this one. And what we need to do here is very, very straightforward. We are going to go down and fill in the truth table. Now we've got an all here on A or C. So in the A or C column, I'm looking for a one. Nope, nope, yes, 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 yes. Next column along is B and C. Both B and C need to be a one for us to get a one here. No, 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 yes, no, yes. Now, this is where it gets a bit more complicated, but actually, it's really, really easy. A or C is this column. 
B and C is this column. So what we're really doing is XORing these columns. So if they're the same value, I'm going to put a zero. If they're different values, I'm going to put a one. Same, same, different, 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 same, different, same. The last thing, this chunk here is this column. So we're doing not this column. It's just the opposite. One, one, zero, 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 one, zero, one. Nice and easy, nice and straightforward. You can repeat that as much as you want. And those questions tend to come up at the start of the paper for a number of marks. Simplification then. This, you'll see, hopefully, I've already got written down here. And hopefully that's not too uh, dark for you all. Uh, but we're going to simplify this. Now, if you want a cheat sheet, if you want a bunch of rules to look at, then have a look at this. That cheat sheet there is what I'm going to be using to fill this in. So I'm going to pop back to my um, camera, pop that back up there, and I'm going to simplify. Now, the only way to do this is to practice them, unfortunately. That's the easiest way to do it. So my first job here is I've got a B and a not B. Now, in my notes, that comes up to or zero. And an all zero is just itself, so that cancels it out. So we're left with this entire chunk here. I can't simplify that without multiplying it out, so let's do that. A and A, sorry, A and not A, or A and B, or not C and A, or not C and B, or A and not B, or A and C. Now we've got a bunch of things there. But I think what we want to look at is we want to get the, the knots and the actual values together to see if they can cancel out for anything interesting to happen. I've got an A and a not A there, so that disappears in the same way as it did up here. So I've got an A and a B. I've also got an A and a not B over here. So I'm going to bring that over. I've also got an A and a C, an A and a not C, that's this one here, and not C or a B. That's all the elements brought over. So I think what I'm going to try and do is take the A out of this entire thing in one step, because it's the common factor. So A and B or not B or C or not C. Now this is where we get useful things. A B or a not B, that's going to Simplify down to one, so that's going to be one, or, and a C and a not C, so C or a not C simplifies down to a one as well. So repetition here, that means that's just A dot one, and A dot one is just itself. So there's my simplification steps as we go. If you want to revise that, you need to go and practice it. You really, really do need to go and practice that. Let's put my cheat sheet up. I'd really recommend you take a print screen of this. The and and the all rules are the things that you need to have remembered. Everything else you should be able to apply quite easily. Moving on. Time is slipping away from us, so we need to be as quick as we can for this. Data transmission is next. So data transmission is just reminding you the ways in which we can transmit data across the network. First of all, Sorry, my chat over oh, it doesn't seem to be working. So apologies if people are chatting on Twitch. I don't seem to be seeing it at the moment. So uh, I'll see what I can do about that. See if I can see anything. Aha, things are popping up now. So hopefully I'll be able to pop things up in a minute and let you see what's going on. But I'm having a bit of trouble, sorry, seeing the Twitch chats. So apologies for that. Right, serial transmission. Data is transmitted one bit uh, after another. So serial transmission is I'm sending one bit after the other down the cable to the recipient. Boom, boom. It's going to be your fastest method of transmission, but the only problem is I can only send one bit at a time in one direction. Parallel, I can send more than one bit at a time, so I can send both things at the same time. But of course, it's going to take twice as long to get there if I'm sending more than one bit at the same time. Simplex is transmitting data in one direction. So I can only send in the one direction, and I can't send it back. So that would be a terrible cable. Uh, all the bandwidth is used, though. So this would be great if I'm just broadcasting. So what I'm doing now, sending you live video across the internet, would be great as simplex. 
so I could push it to you in the ultimate of 4K. I say that if I paid for the more expensive plan, but I don't. So you get it in 720p, sorry. Duplex, data travels in both directions at the same time. Brilliant. I'm using half the bandwidth because I need half the bandwidth to send and half the bandwidth to receive. Um, there's also a potential issue because data could collide. If data collides, we are going to get lost data on that transmission medium. Half duplex is great. I can transmit in both directions, but only one at a time. This is the best of both worlds, really. I can fire my file down the cable at you, and you can't send anything back to me. But once that cable is free, you can fire that back to me, and I get them both at full speed. There's no danger of data collisions. It's going to be brilliant as a result of that. All the bandwidth is used, no danger of data collection. There's also multiplexing. This is where we get several sources gathered together and sent down a single cable, which is brilliant because we can then go and off we go all at the same time. We also need to know about packets for this, and a packet is a single part of a file. Now, the average packet size, believe it or not, believe it or not, is one and a half kilobytes, which great, absolutely tiny. Imagine that four and a half gigabyte video file that's certainly not titled Spider-Man No Way Home dot mp4 that you are sharing right now on a torrent that entire thing has been broken up into millions of 1.5 kilobyte files to go down your network cable each of those individual packets have the following a destination address so where it's going a sender address where it came from the packet number number 400 out of 43 million so we know which order to put it back together in an error control bit that's to make sure that the file the packet has arrived in a good state and hasn't corrupted. Control signals tell us how to manage it. And the data is a small part of that packet. Okay, data transmission done. We're really doing badly for time, so I'm going to keep going. Data representation and data structures here. Type, sorry. Binary and hex conversion you need to be able to do. Binary addition you need to be able to do. Floating point you need to be able to do. I'm not going to cover this question, although it's worth having a look at. You need to convert the denary numbers 87 and 113 into their equivalents using unsigned 8-bit binary. So just translate them into binary. Remember, each bit in hex is worth four bits in binary. So basically, 887 eight, in uh, denary there. Oh, sorry. We're converting them into binary, aren't we? Misreading the question. 87 needs to be converted to binary, 113 needs to be converted to binary, and you add them both together there. Uh, when you're converting from binary to hex, which sometimes happens, you're doing the half bits and turn them into nibbles, which is a little bit easier. But what I want to show you is this one, because people get stuck on the mantissa and exponent all the time. First thing we need to remember is that a mantissa and exponent should be said to be in two's complementation. That means that no matter how many bits we've got, the most significant bit will be the minus version of whatever's there. So in this case, one, two, four, eight. That most significant bit is worth minus eight. If it were an eight-bit byte, the most significant bit would be worth minus 128. That's what two's complementation has been. In this case, we've got an eight-bit mantissa and a four-bit exponent. And we need to convert the number 4.125 into floating point form. Now, I believe that 0.125 is an eighth. So first job is to write that down in fixed point binary. So you remember the way binary works is we've got one, two, four. Now because it's two's complementation, I'm just gonna go a step further and put an eight, an eight in there because it's gonna be the negative version of itself. And to represent four, I need to do zero. So there are no negative eights, there's four, nothing there. How do I represent an eighth then? Well, I just keep going in this direction because it goes the opposite way then. A half, a quarter, an eighth. That is the fixed point representation of 4.125, but we want floating point. So what we need to do is work out how many spaces this needs to jump to the left to get it into normal form. Normal form for a positive number is 0 0.1 something. Normal form for a negative number is 1 point something. This is a positive number, I need it in 0 0.1 something. So I'll be jumping the point one, two, three. So I need to represent plus three in my exponent. So my exponent is four bits. It's in two's complementation, so this is a minus eight. So representing plus three in this is 
that. I've got eight bits for my mantissa. So I'm going to write it out. I've used one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I've got one more bit that I'm missing. I just put a zero in there. Boom. There's your answer. Again, worth practicing because these questions tend to come up every year. So the more you do, the more confident you'll be answering those repeated questions. I'm going to take a second to stop there because it's really important that we think about um, that we think about how the exam might go tomorrow. They've said to us no surprises, uh, but having looked at the um, or having talked to students who took the RE exam yesterday, they were saying that it wasn't past paper questions, but they were straightforward questions. So I don't really know what that means for us tomorrow. Hopefully that will mean the same. They may not be exact past paper questions, but they will be the straightforward version of each of the questions, in which case I think we're all in a good place. Right, number five, data structures. Okay, so your arrays. Most people have learned to program in Python. Python doesn't use arrays. What we've called arrays in Python were actually lists, and that's something a little bit different. Arrays, as far as you need to talk about in an exam, are the same data type. They are fixed size. They can be multidimensional, which we'll have a look at in a second. And they're what we call a random access data structure. What that means is, if I pick any particular piece of that array randomly, I can access it in the same amount of time. Here's a 1D array on the left and a 2D array on the right. A 1D array has multiple rows. It is zero indexed. If I wanted to access maths, I'd have the name of the array in square bracket with the index in it. That would give me access to the row index one, which would contain maths. So it's going to be the array name and in square brackets, the row index. And remember, the indexing starts at zero. In a 2D array, it's a little bit different. If I wanted to access Mrs. James there, I'd need to give the row number first and then the column number. So it's the opposite, really, to everything else. So to get Mrs. James, we'd say subjects, row two, column one. And that would be row number and then column. I will just bring a quest. I will just bring a point up here. Somebody's mentioned this. Everyone was saying further maths today was awful. You never know. It might just have felt that way. I wouldn't worry too much about this tomorrow. The important thing is, You've all done revision. You all know your stuff. You've had a rubbish time in terms of COVID and isolation and all that stuff. So the WJC hopefully will be giving us an exam that thinks about those things and is a straightforward representation of the knowledge you should have learned. We can keep our fingers crossed at the very least, but don't panic about it. All you can do is your very best. And if they give us a difficult exam, well, everyone in Wales has sat a difficult exam. So we'll all be in the same boat, okay? So please don't panic about how difficult or odd other exams might have been. We just got to take it on face value. Okay, so there's arrays. That's the most you need to care about for data structures, really, at, at AS. Organization of data is about really how you would organize data in a, in a meaningful way. So first of all, a file is made up of records and fields, okay? A record is going across and a field is going down. You can think about it this way. A record is a collection of different data about one thing or one object. And a field is lots of different um, items about one topic. So in this case, we've got Catherine Stewart is a record, and we've got all her information. Uh, but a field is the surname. And we could go down there and see all the different surnames we've got. There are different types of fields. One of the things WJ love to do in their practical exam is to put fixed length fields in. You've seen this. Most of you know that I've moaned about this for a long time. You don't reuse fixed length fields anymore because what a fixed length field is, is where you say, oh, here's a person's name. We're going to use 10 bits to store that. Well, great. If the name's less than that, you'd have to put a bunch of blanks in to make it up to 10. If it was more than that, you just cut it off. Now, it does have one benefit in that you can easily work out how much space you need for a number of records. So if you are planning on storing the records for 20,000 users, you'd know exactly how much space you needed. The more modern way is variable length. There's no preset size. So that means it only takes up as much room as it needs. 
if it's a small thing, it'll go there. If it's a big thing, it'll fill. It'll still use it all, but it'll take up more room. The only problem is that it's not easy to estimate. It's really not easy to estimate. So both are, both are fine. Variable length is the more modern, the more consistent way of doing it. But a fixed length is what you need if you need to be exact on how much space you want. There's also this, which I know a number of you guys in my class found quite difficult as well, was the idea of a transaction and, and, a, and a, a, sorry, a, ma a master and a transaction file. Now, I've tried to make the scale obvious here. The, the master file, the pink one, is basically everything the business holds on something. Now, this file now is so big that we can't easily add to it. We can't easily open and add to it. So we don't use that for just the odd transaction, the odd thing coming into the business. What we do instead is we have a transaction file here, this little one, which is laid out the same. So it's the same fields. And it's the same sort of layout. And we add to that one. That one can open quickly. That one can be filled up quickly. At the end of the day, then, a background process copies everything from there into the right place in the, in the master file. And that happens usually overnight or on some sort of predetermined cycle. And once that's all gone, that's deleted again, and it's ready to go for the next day. So your transaction file never gets too big. That's the purpose of that, and that's the point of it. If you can imagine Amazon has, has this, because if we had to all open the file that had every Amazon order, every time we wanted to put one thing in there, they would never sell anything, because it would take hours to open that file up. We also need to know validation. Here's a very quick checklist for you. But you're talking about things like a presence check. Is it there? A length check. How many characters? A range check. Now, that's between two numbers. Is it bigger than this or smaller than that? Lookup check. It, a lookup check exists in a list. So it's one of a number of items. Usually, it's going to be something like gender or title or country or location, something like that. A format check is where it looks a certain, certain way. A good example of that is an email address. There's also an at symbol in the middle. A type check is that it's a certain type. We are looking to see if it's like an integer or a string or something like that. And then the bottom two are verification. They don't check that it looks right. They check it is right, but they're very hard to code. You've got dual entry where you type it in twice. The most common thing about that is a password. So you're signing up for a service. It asks for your password twice to make sure that you've typed it incorrectly. And then proofreading. But we all know proofreading is a difficult thing to do because your brain takes shortcuts. I'm behind. I'm going to have to speed up database systems next. So here's a relational database. You've all done this for the practical unit. You've got your entities, which are the individual tables that only store information about, about their own topic. Uh, you've got their key fields, the unique identifiers, the thing at the top. And then you've got the relationships. Mainly, you've got a one-to-many relationship. And the way I want you to always think about this is the many side is basically where a drop-down menu would exist. So I've already made my students, but when they're enrolling in classes, I'm going to pick them from a drop-down menu here. I'm going to pick the class from a drop-down menu here. And that helps you conceptualize how that's going to work. The point of a relational database is that between the primary keys and the foreign keys, where you've got a key in another table, it means you minimize redundancy. It means, it means that you only store relevant information in the relevant tables. And the normalization of that, which you have to do for you too, is brilliant. It makes them astoundingly fast and quick and easy. One thing to remember, though, please, is that you will be expected to do this process in Unit 2. So that does mean the chances of getting a question on that are lower in Unit 1, but it doesn't mean the chances are impossible. We've all seen the 2017 and the 2018 past papers where they were asked specifically. Number eight, the operating system. This one, Little bit dry, I won't lie to you, but operating systems. What you actually need to know, despite every fun thing we've talked about, is that an operating system's job is to manage resources. What are those resources? Peripherals, inputs and outputs devices. They are talking to the operating system, which is deciding what to do with them. So when I press a key and I'm in the middle of the game, the operating system routes that key press into my game. We've all accidentally pressed the Windows key when we're in the middle of a really important level or a death match or something and been taken to the start menu and died. That's where the operating system is misplacing the command into the wrong place. It also deals with processes in working out, well, what needs processing time? Can I be fair with it? Can I distribute it? The same is true of memory protection. 
It's going to make sure that apps can't interact with each other's RAM, so they can't change values like passwords or things like that. And it also man manages the backing storage, which again is the hard drive. So in order for me as a program to save to my computer, I just say to the operating system, save this, please. And the operating system does the job of spinning the hard drive and putting it in the right place or finding a blank space in the SSD and putting it in there. There are two main kinds of user interface you need to know about, but there are more. The graphical user interface, what we use normally, icons, windows, menus, all that sort of stuff, and the command line interface, or the CLUI, which is basically going to be text and typing commands. We still use both today. GUI is better for non-technical users. A command line interface is good for technical users because things that might take me 15 clicks in a GUI, I can write one command for and run it. There are also three modes of operation you need to be aware of. Batch processing, where all the jobs the operating system needs to do gets collected together and processed at the end of the night. Real-time control, where I press a key and something happens there and then. But that's important if human life is at stake. So if it's a safety system like air traffic control, you want that. And then there's real-time transactional. That's more like um, a ticket buying system in that it has to work more or less now, but actually it can do a bit of work behind the scenes and be a bit clever about when it's going to process stuff so it doesn't accidentally double book tickets. You need to be able to talk about all this and there's a chance that this is what the essay question would be about. I think Joel asked uh, this question earlier. What do you reckon the big marker will be this year? I don't know is the honest answer, but if I take a guess, I'd be guessing at operating systems. It's a big unit. There's a lot to talk about there. There's a bunch to waffle on about. It hasn't been asked for a couple of years. And I think that the knowledge-wise, it's reasonably straightforward. If the morals and the ethics are not all the systems analysis stuff and not in those questions, this is a good one to place your bets on. But I don't know any more than you. I don't work for WJC. I'm just a teacher in a school. I know what you know in terms of the context of those exams. Okay, we're getting there. Nine, algorithms and programs. Okay, remembering algorithms are just, the, it's just the fancy word we use for the instructions being used in the order. On the left, you've got flowcharts, okay? With the symbols that we've used before. You should be able to read them. You should be able to write them. You might have learned pseudocode. Now, a lot of us don't teach pseudocode because WJC, you don't have to write in pseudocode, but you should be able to read it. It should make some sort of sense. It is basically code-like language. It's not really a programming language, and there really shouldn't be any rules for it, but there you go. Then the types of search. Linear search goes from start to finish. So in this example, if I'm looking for D, it starts at zero, and it keeps working through until it finds it, and then it returns the location of where it found it. Binary search is better, but it only works on a sorted list. What we do with the binary search is we say, right, I'm looking for D. Find the midpoint. So it says the midpoint C. And it says, is that D? Well, it's not. Okay, fine. But if that's not D, is D going to be on the right or the left? Is it greater than or less than? Well, it's greater than. So that means I can ignore the left-hand side completely. I have halved the amount of items I need to search through in one fell swoop there. Find the midpoint again. E. It's not D, but D's on the left. And then finally, I found it. And this is amazing because it took me three steps to find that in a small array. But if that array was 20 billion items long, every time I searched, I would halve it. So the first time I looked, I would only have 10 billion, then five, then two and a half. Linear search is going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Worst case scenario, it's not there. And it has to go through all 20 billion. Okay, sorts. We all love a bit of bubble sorts. Remember, the point of bubble source is it's going to look in pairs. It's going to go from left to right. If they're in the wrong order, it'll swap it. It has to get from left to right in one go without doing any swaps for it to be sorted. So in this case, we say C and A. Are they the right order? They're not. So I swap. I move on to the next pair. C and D. Are they in the right order? They are. Move on to the next pair. D and E. Are they in the right order? They are. Move on to the next pair, E and F, are they in the right order? They are. B and F, they're in the wrong order. Swap. So I've gone from left to right once, and I, ha I have made a swap, so I have to go again. I'm going to fast forward now just to show you what happened. So I'm going from left to right, I do another one. Go from left to right, I do another one. Go from left to right, I do another one. And I'd have to do it one more time. 
go from left to right, no swaps, boom, we're done. Bubble saw is a nightmare. Bubble saw is horrendous. It's no good for anybody, but it's nice and simple to learn, which is why it's in the specification. You might need to know to read that in code as well, but the swaps are the important bit. Insertion, what we're doing here, and it's a bit of a cheat, to be honest, is we're going to move the first element out of the array onto its own. That means that on the left is a sorted array. There's one thing in it, it has to be sorted. And then we take each other element and put it in the right place. So A goes in the left. Next element's F, goes in the right. Next element, E, slots in between C and, e, and F. You might be thinking there, hold on, how does it know where to go? Well, this is where we're, we're cheating you because there would be an algorithm for where to put it in as well. We assume it's a linear thing. We go from left to right until we find out where it's going, which slows it down immeasurably. But true insertion sort would have a cleverer algorithm to decide where to go. Uh, D then goes in after E, and B goes in after A. Remember, there's an algorithm going off there. So it's actually quite a neat, neat way of doing it. You will probably find it unlikely to see this written down in code form in an exam because they don't give you that algorithm for how it gets inserted. And because they don't do that, you're unlikely to see it in pseudocode form. Merge sort is the last one you need to know. Remember, we separate them into individual parts, and then we pair them up, putting them in the right place. So we pair them up, and then we start to sort the pairs. So C and A, sort them out. Then F and E, sort them out. Then D and B, we sort them out. We pair them up again. We sort those one item at a time. A, C, E, F. And we're always looking at the leftmost item to see which one goes in first. We pair these up. I remember looking at the leftmost, which one comes down first? A, so C and B, B, C and D, C, D. And when we've done that, we can just pull the rest of that down automatically and we've got a sorted array. Much, much faster than the other two, much, much easier to talk about, however difficult to code. 10, principles of programming, 20 minutes, really struggling now. So paradigms. Paradigms are styles of programming, and different paradigms give you advantage and disadvantages. The ones you need to care about are procedural language, uh, procedural languages. That's what we've covered so far, things like Python. Event-driven programs allow us to specify what's going to happen when something clicks. So you may have done that if you've done JavaScript and you've done events, on click, those sorts of things. We've also seen visual programming languages like Scratch that are easier for beginners and markup languages like HTML, which allow you to describe how something should be or how something should look. They're not really programming languages. They are languages to express how something should look. There's also different levels of computer languages. The one on the right, the machine code, is what's being run by the processor. And we are on the left. We're in Python code. We're in a high-level program. Basically, the closer you get to low level, the harder it is to program, but the faster it will run on the computer. There are programs that will take Python code and turn it into machine code for us. Software engineering is all about IDEs. You need to know the advantages of them. Again, this could be another one for that long essay question. Name advantages of IDEs. One thing is called code autocomplete, which is there's an example GIF on the board at the moment, where you start typing and it suggests variable names or functions for you. There's bracket matching, where you click a bracket and it shows you the matching pair so you know where you are. There's syntax checking, so as you type, checking to see if your syntax is correct and doing underlines if it's wrong, so you can see errors before you even click run. There's syntax highlighting as well, as you've got there. The different command words are in different colors, so it's easier to read. Stepping allows you to put a pause in the code and move one line at a time through it, so you can see what's happening and see how the variables are changing. And breakpoints allow you to put a little stop command in the code. You run it and it'll stop at the point where you've put the stop and show you all the variables and what's happened. All of those are why IDEs are better than just using Notepad in a compiler, which is how I started programming back in the black and white era. Program construction. Okay, so an assembler is needed to turn assembly code into machine code. Now, assembly code on the left there, one line is one line of machine code. It's just written in a way that humans can read. So there's really no, no difference. It's quite quick. Then for high level code, we have interpreters and compilers. For Python, you use an interpreter and it live converts the code as you're running it into machine code. And that has advantages. I can write my code and run it on any machine that has the interpreter. 
It has a disadvantage though. If there's an error in it, I might never have seen it until I run it on that particular machine. And if it doesn't, it's never run that line of code before, I never would have seen the error. A compiler is what we use for video games. There's C there or C++, depending upon your cup of tea. Um, and this language would be turned into machine code before it was run. So you click compile and you'd wait the time for the computer to check it all. It takes ages to do that in advance and it'll crash sometimes and do weird things. But what you get out the other side is a machine code file that will run directly on the computer without a problem. You also need to understand how code is turned from code into machine code. And there's these four basic steps. The first one is lexical analysis that takes all the, all the words and separates them into individual tokens. So separate blocks for each of them. It finds the keywords and identifiers and removes the white space. That's then passed on to the syntax analysis, which checks to make sure that the tokens or the words are in the right order. That's then passed on to the semantic analysis, which is pretty much, does it do what you think it should do? Are you trying to add two ints together or are you trying to add an int to a string? And if it passes that, it gets turned into the ones and zeros, the actual code. That They are the steps of program construction. It is very, very straightforward, but go back over your notes and just check that each stage is clear in your mind what's actually happening. Okay, we're getting there, 15 minutes, and I've got three topics. We're about back on time. This one's a weird one. It's types of software, basically. So I know we've talked about this a lot recently, but it's very straightforward stuff. You've got two pairs of opposites. Open source and closed source are the first opposite you need to care about. Open source is software where you can see the code. You can go and find the code, add to it, contribute to it, change it to your heart's content. It's normally free, but you don't get much support. If something goes wrong, you either have to fix it yourself or get people in the community to help you with it. I'm just going to pick that question up from, uh, from Matt at three. If there's an algorithm question asking you to write one, what's a good way to practice? There are a couple there that you might want to go and have a look at. Um, just to, to test your test it with it. The past paper collection, and especially if you've got the Educast papers as well, there's some similar questions. The only way to practice though, to be honest, is what you should have done in the last couple of months in computer science lessons is constantly being given, try and build a program that does this, try and build a program that does this. And it's practice, it's practice to get used to those skills. But in this short term, go and look at the past paper questions and see the sorts of things they want. There's always a mark for, putting some inputs in, putting some outputs in, putting an if statement in, and putting some variables in. So look at what you can do for the, the most marks quickly. And don't worry too much about the program being perfect. So the opposite to open source is closed source. This could be like Word or, or Photoshop. You can't see the code. You probably paid for it. And if you need support, it's there. And there's a big community of people and paid people willing to help you. I tend to use as much open source as I can, but sometimes open source just isn't good enough and you need to use things like Photoshop as an aside. Then our other one, sorry, is uh, bespoke software versus off the shelf. Bespoke is custom. You've got a problem, you want software, it does everything you want, you've had it made, but it's expensive. It took time, it took money, and it took effort to support it. You have to pay people to support it. It's all custom, but it does everything you want. The opposite of that is off the shelf. It's generic. It's Microsoft Word. It does most of what you want it to do, but not everything. But it's cheap. You can have it straight away. The cost is negligible compared to having custom software built. And there's loads of support there already. You also have to know a little bit about how weather forecasting systems work. I haven't put that in here because there's a past paper question on it. I believe it's 2018. Go back and have a read of the exemplar answer for that. And you'll get everything you need to know about weather forecasting. The other thing, there was an expert system, an expert system you've seen a million times, but not by its proper name, probably. It's a system that suggests problems based on the input you've put into it. It's things that say, has this happened? Yes or no. Has this happened? Yes or no. And eventually it diagnoses you. If you have ever used NHS Direct or anything like that, you will have found something that um, covers that criteria. Question from Kevin here. Does bespoke software provide lots of support? Only if you pay for it, Kevin. If you have the software built and then you just leave it, you would have zero support. And nobody has ever seen that software before because it's all custom. What we're looking for with bespoke software really is paying the company that made it for you to keep supporting it. And that costs 
a lot of money. Okay, two more to go. Practical programming. Now, this is the topic that I can talk to you about the least because this is what we did when we learned to program in Python. This is what we spent months and months on. When you get into the exam question and it asks you to write code, you do not need to write pseudocode, even if it asks you to. You can write in any programming language of your choice or even structured English. So I would highly recommend that my students try and write your program in Python. Even if you can't remember the exact syntax, and I've given you an example on the bottom there, that's how you write a controlled for loop in Python on the left. But if I couldn't remember how to write that in an exam, I might write that thing on the right. That's structured English. That's English explaining a programming construct, and they are worth about the same. Now, of course, you're going to get more for a working program, but loop a hundred times, a little colon and an indent would do me just as well as having the exact code. If you knew, if you know your pseudocode, you can roll out your pseudocode. But again, pseudocode and the style they give you for the WJC is very much based on Visual Basic. And I wouldn't want any of you working in Visual Basic as your programming language of choice because ugh, it's not 1996. We should be using modern programming languages. And if you haven't, you've probably got an advantage in pseudocode. But you can write however you want as long as the code looks right. Take your time. Think about it. Because if they ask you to write an algorithm, there are going to be marks for inputs with good variable names, if statements, loops, outputs, doing some maths right. If it's an eight marker, you can guarantee there are four marks for very, very simple things. It's not about getting 100%. It is about maximizing your marks in that area. Go into the exam with that mindset. None of this is about getting 100%. It is about getting the most marks you can for each question type. Some of us are going to have strengths in one question type. Some of us are going to have strengths in others. Please go and use your revision time that you have remaining effectively. Last topic, good timing, data security and integrity. The key things are these three areas. One are the dangers that data can be in from hackers, from malware, from Muppets that work for your organization. Everything that could go wrong with that data, go and have a read up on it. It's probably stuff you know already because this is an interesting topic. So I've reduced my slides on this massively. The thing everyone hates though is the disaster planning questions. As I've said to you before, disaster planning is really one of the most important things that a company can do. It is about sitting down when you're setting up and going, right, if a disaster like fire, flood, hacking, cybersecurity incidents, loss of data, hardware failure, if any of that happens, what are we going to do? So beforehand, we can mitigate problems by backing up, blah, de, blah, de, blah. Uh, during an attack or a damage, we can have a plan in place about who are we calling, who's doing what, who's turning the electricity off, who's calling the fire department, all those sorts of things that you might want to think about that you might be panicking about in the moment you plan for. And afterwards, after a disaster like this, you want to reflect on it, improve on it, see what went well and what didn't. And if you do that right, you update your disaster plan, and the next time something like that happens, it runs smoother, it's over with quicker, less data is lost, it's a better effort. That's a common question. And again, I think it was the 2018 paper where that was a, a, a four to six marker about halfway through. Have a look. These things come up. They are a little boring. They are not something that sticks in your brain, but they are very, very important for data security and integrity. And the last thing before I go and finish up and go to questions in the chat is the difference between malicious accidental damage and we need to make sure that we have a distinct difference in our heads malicious damage is where somebody seeks out to cause damage to data for your organization i am trying purposely to delete all your stuff or ddos your server i am doing it for a bad reason that's problematic but there are not that many people willing to do that the bigger problem, of course, is accidental damage, where somebody that works for you or somebody in your school accidentally presses delete on the wrong file or saves over the top of a file. All of this stuff 
can be prevented by thinking about things like logins, uh, levels of access, read and write access to certain files, and even just should these people be allowed to see these folders or not. You can plan for most of that stuff, but the most common thing that can go wrong with data is that somebody can accidentally save over the top of it. And I'm sure you've had this problem as well. I'm going to put a question where we can all feel your pain here. Yeah, apologies. Uh, but uh, Joel's got a question here, sorry. Uh, what's the structure for those um, high markers? So there is a structure. The main thing I would say to worry about is that you should be looking at um, you should be looking at the uh, lack of repetition and the important flow of the um, essay as the key thing. Now, I would always recommend that instead of writing everything in paragraphs, you write individual full sentences in bullet points. That will stop you repeating your points because it's very clear what's going on there. And you want to try and structure your answer as if it was an essay. So you want to group similar points together. You want to do comparisons together. And you want to draw to some sort of conclusion. There should be a logical progression. It should build to something meaningful. That's the way the structure works. The best thing you can do, though, is go to the mark schemes of 2019, 2018, 2017 past paper and have a look at the banding. When we mark this paper, we read it, we tick key points that we think are meaningful, then we look at the banding. We put them in the band and then we give them marks dependent upon that. If you can get yourself in the top band because of the structure of how you've written it, there's no repetition, it flows nicely, good technical answers, good clear comparisons, and a good conclusion, then you're automatically going to be in that A and that B group. That's where you want to be. Buses, are they an A-level? I think so. I haven't got the spec here straight away, but all you need to remember about buses is they transmit the data. So if it's a data bus, they take the data. If it's an address bus, they transmit the address. If it is a control bus, it transmits the control signal. Even if they're not on AS, and I've just been teaching them for years because I'm a Muppet, it's very, very easy to bring that through. Right, so done. All the topics covered. Good luck for your exam tomorrow. I'm sure a lot of you feel that you do need it, but I can tell you now from me, do not. Your exam is because you've taken the time to prepare. You've come to this revision tonight, and you are going to take your time tomorrow to make sure you're in a good place for it. Key things to do before the exam. Make sure those key laws, the things that simplify down in logical operations, you memorize. If you can't memorize them, repeat themselves to yourself as the exam starts. Keep thinking them through. Keep your brain on a loop with them. And the moment the person says start, jot them down on the paper or flip to that question first. There is nothing to say that you have to do the paper in the order in which it's given to you. In fact, I would say, go and find the questions you feel confident with first, specifically the mathsy type questions. I would certainly go and look for those, and maybe the essay question. Get those out of the way in the first pass, and then work your way through the rest of it. That's certainly something I would have done to make sure that I get the most marks in the least amount of time. Question here about the Data Protection Act. You don't, according to the WJC, need to learn the Data Protection Act for this year because that would be in the legal, the moral, the ethical section, which they have removed from this exam. Now, that's what they said in this circular. Again, I don't work for the exam board, so I can't be 100% on that. But according to what they've said, I would imagine that you don't need to worry about that. Learn it if you want. Definitely worthwhile. It's an important thing in the world, but... As Father the WJC have said, I don't think it's going to be in there. If I go back to my first slide here, I will show you. There we go. So once again, these are the accommodations for your exam. These are the things the WJC have taken out of your syllabus. Hopefully most of your teachers, I certainly have taught this because it's important. But systems analysis, the waterfall model, and even a little bit of agile if you touched on it, not going to be in this exam. 
17, Economic, Moral, Legal, Digital Data Protection Act. Ethical and cultural issues are not going to be in this exam. Quick question here. Do you need to know how an OS specifically manages resources? Or would it be high marks? <laughs> Again, I don't write I don't write the papers. I've never seen it as a high mark question. I would imagine it would be discuss what an OS does, and that would be part of the answers. It would be taking those four parts and expanding upon them. That would be more than enough content for a long form question. I think worst case scenario, you've got a question on um, operating systems and it's an essay question. It just goes operating systems. What are they for? What do they do? What's the type of interface? Discuss. And then you have to try and structure that in an interesting way. Okay, last point before I go, because I am going to have to disappear tonight. OOP. Okay, so object oriented program, the idea basically is that a class is like a template. Okay, a template has methods and it has data or properties in it. They're unique. Now think about this in terms of video game. So a template is the template for a, an enemy. When I create an enemy, I create an instance of it, I instantiate it, and the enemy appears in my game, fully formed, with all those settings already in there. So an object in this case, then, would be an instance, an instance of a class. OK. Thank you very much, everyone, for all your questions and comments tonight. I'm sorry I can't stay any longer, but I've got a meeting to get to now, which I've got about 10 seconds to get to. So I'm going to be disappearing in a moment to go to that. But make sure you get a good night's sleep. That's much more important than killing yourself, filling your brain full of revision. Okay? Get a good night's sleep so you can think clearly tomorrow. You've got the morning to prep. I know some of you have got exam clashes, so you'll have that lovely gap in the middle. You can't do anything but prep. And take your time on the exam. We believe in you. We know you can do it. You definitely can. Good luck for tomorrow. You'll do well.